Welcome back. You're watching To The Point. At the center of the espionage scandal that's making headlines is former journalist Shantanu Saikya. Now, as an entrepreneur, he's accused of wrongly obtaining secret documents to hand over to business clients. But a recent blog by a former advisor of a former finance minister suggests this is just the tip of a very worrying iceberg. It could be far wider than we actually realize. So tonight we ask, does this reveal a worrying aspect of Indian journalism or is that an unjustified conclusion? My guests are former advisor to former finance minister Yashwan Sinha, Mohan Guruswamy, the managing editor of the Business Standard, Rahul Jacob, the former editor of the Hindu, Siddharth Vardarajan, and one of India's foremost sociologists, Ashish Nandi. Mohan Guruswamy, let me start with a simple question. Is the Shantanu Saikya episode where a former journalist, now an entrepreneur, is allegedly involved in accessing secret documents and then making them available to businessmen, in your eyes, a one-off development? Or do you think this is the tip of a very worrying iceberg? Which is it? I think this is the tip of a very worrying iceberg. This is, this is not a, a one-off thing. This is quite, quite pandemic. Quite pandemic. Quite pandemic. And, uh, and, and fairly common because many journalists double up as, as corporate lobbyists, many journalists double up as corporate informants and so you know this is par for the course. Okay. Rahul Jacob, we don't have a clear line to Mohan Guruswami at the moment. Hopefully it would improve. But he's made one thing clear. He believes this is the tip of a worrying iceberg. This is quite endemic. Now, it's often been said that the journalists who work for pink papers are either themselves on the payroll of industrialists or businessmen or act as conduits for them. As someone who's managing editor of a pink paper, is that an allegation, an image that is unfair? Or would you be honest enough to say that there sometimes could be some truth to this? Well, there sometimes could be some truth to it. There may be a couple of rotten apples in the system, but the idea that all pink papers are in the pay of tycoons is ludicrous. The truth is, the problem begins and ends, as most problems usually do in India, with the government. At issue here is some peons got a hold of documents that then got out of the ministry. Uh, CCTVs were turned off. That suggests there's a problem in the government. Um, there, there is a proposal, it's in fact in tomorrow's business standard, there's a proposal for an e-office, essentially a paperless office, in government in 2008. The software was ready two years later. Five years on, there are files going round okay. and round in circles, like the earth going round the sun or something. Um, so the problem is really the government. It goes back to 1956 when the second administrative reform called for fewer let's, clerical let's, let's staff. Take, let's take uh, to this yeah. instance rather than get lost in the history of what hasn't been done, because that's a different story sure. though an interesting one. You've heard Rahul Jacobs say this is a problem for governments and in a sense when governments leak it is a problem for them, no one would deny it. But I'm more interested in the extent to which it's a problem for journalists. How serious is the breach of ethics and morality when journalists use their access not to promote journalism, not to further freedom of expression, but to make money for themselves by providing valuable but secret information to businessmen? Because that is at the core of this problem to the extent to which journalists lie at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can well understand this. Uh, what looks like scoop at first sight uh, may have uh, as its byproduct some more secrets which are handed over in private to industrialists. I think this is a very sad development, almost as sad as that of paid uh, editorials. So would you say that when a journalist acquires secret information and then hands it over to a businessman to further that businessman's interest and in return gets some favor or some reward, that he's perhaps letting down his profession? Certainly. Not only letting down his profession, he's letting down in some sense the uh, certain important political processes. Like for example, in this instance, um, it um, makes the budget exercise almost meaningless. So then this is in fact not just a vitiation of journalistic principles, but it is a serious and deeply worrying ethical and moral lapse. Absolutely. There's no two ways about it. No, I, I don't think so. 
and we as journalists can't turn around and say the problem begins because the government leaks. No, we're I don't agree with that. We're just beneficiaries. At all. I don't believe with the, that position at all. So that was the Rajan, if I understand <coughs> your views correctly, you believe that there's a danger of making sweeping generalizations and tarring the journalist profession. After what you've heard Professor Nandi say, and he said it very unequivocally, how would you defend a journalist when they get caught up in this sort of messy situation? Well, first off, I think it's important just to, clar to clarify that whatever I have to say has uh, no bearing on uh, the case of Shantanu Hoikya because he's been accused of something, he has to defend himself. So I'm saying everything, anything without prejudice to his case. Now, the minute a journalist begins to serve anybody other than his or her editor or his, and his or her readers, you have a problem. This may take the form of a journalist uh, selling information or doing a story uh, that favors uh, somebody uh, unduly or uh, does a, uh, you know, plants information on behalf of a government minister or the government itself. Uh, you know, so, so, and Indian media, Indian journalism unfortunately is rife with uh, these kinds of ethical violations uh, of which clearly you know, lobbying for a corporate or uh, procuring papers or perhaps uh, in, in, engaging in uh, commerce over documents may be one, one part of this. So I am so the first to admit that this is a problem with journalism. I think Professor Nandi is right that this is uh, an evil on par with paid news, uh, arguably it's a part of the wider phenomenon of paid news. But I think we need to be careful not to throw the baby out of the bathwater. This, you know, journalists depend on leaked documents to do stories. And uh, it's, you know, oftentimes uh, it's convenient for the government to accuse uh, a journalist of uh, simply pandering to this or that corporate lobby. Uh, okay. You know, and I think that we need to be careful uh, in, in making sweeping uh, statements about uh, Indian journalism in general. Quite right. There's no doubt that this is an important point you make, that when governments discover that awkward documents have fallen into the hands of journalists who, as a result, revealed some discrepancy on the part of the government, the government always turns around and either throws the Official Secrets Act to them or claims that they're in the pay of some commercial lobby. That's a good point that you're making. But Mohan Guruswami, in contrast, the blog which you put up Oh, we don't have Mohan Guru Swami. What a pity. I'll have to go back to him because that was a critical story about Shantanu Saikya. And in fact, the story was about how Mohan Guru Swami, when he was advisor to former finance minister Yashwan Sinha, had written a note on the disinvestment of Maruti. And that note was leaked literally hours after he wrote it. Not even 24 hours, just hours after. You're there with us, Mohan Guru Swami. Give us details of that particular story, which proves that things can get leaked from within the ministry and from within the laptop computer of the finance minister's advisor within hours. Give us details of that story. Well, I had written the note about disinvestment from Maruti and <coughs> sent it to the minister. I had done it on my word, own, own word processor because the minister said, you know, don't do it in the section. And so I printed it out on my computer and then <coughs> sent the paper, you know, to be entered into the register and then sent off to the minister. And between that and the minister's office, this appeared in the press the next morning. And, and the journalist uh, who published it, it in the Financial byline. Express, you're saying, was Shantanu Saikya, the very yes, man at the right. center and of the confusion. The byline of the, a byline of the same Mr. Saikia. So I asked a friend from the, who was an additional secretary in the RAW as to can he find out what happened. And so they put their sleuths on the job and then came up with his name and said that, you know, not only does he access these documents, he accesses other documents. At which stage I sent a note to the secretary of expenditure at that time, uh, who also looks after the establishment, saying that this uh, particular journalist should be put under watch and his entry should be restricted. To which I was told that, you know, this will impinge on fr the freedom of the press and journalists come and go and the finance ministry is acting in an open place and we should be more careful with our papers. So obviously he's been doing it for a long time and there's a lot of license in the system. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a very fine line between, you know, this could be a genuine scoop that, you know, he got my note going to the minister. But suppose that note went off to the hands of... Uh, uh, some companies or business rivals. So then it becomes a different thing. Absolutely. The nature of the, uh, of the let crime me, changes Let me completely. pause you there, Mohan Guruswami. You raised several very important issues and with the other guests on the panel, I'd like to take them through those issues that you raised one by one. First, Rahul Jacob, 
in that blog that I refer to Mohan Guruswami writes and I'm quoting this activity is a major business in New Delhi and the sheer number of independent consultants individual and firms PR agencies in their glitzy offices and large cars are a testimony of its success and all pervasiveness would you agree with that or do you think there's a tendency here to over exaggerate Well, this is true of every major capital in the world. Washington, D.C. Uh, has a $3.5 billion lobbying industry. I would question whether it's possible to describe some of this as journalism or simply as lobbying. So that's, that's point number one. Um, the, the other is if Mohan Guruswamy wrote that and used only email, it's possible that email would have been hacked. But this antiquated system of sending files from one office to another to another just begs for the kind of abuse but, that but we've seen me, in this But forgive case. me, forgive me, forgive me. It didn't actually go from one office to another to another. Within hours of him doing it on his own laptop or his own desktop, he actually then gave it to be registered, which is perhaps a bureaucratic procedure to go to the minister and literally within yes, hours it got leaked but it went in paper form it sounds like so you're saying that the fact it, it, it went, went in paper, in paper form, form puts the onus of the leaking like. on Where the government it? rather than on someone else are you still saying the government is to blame rather than anyone Certainly else they should control it Jaipal Reddy J Jaipal Reddy when he was running the petroleum ministry limited d uh, sensitive documents going to a total of three or four people okay. that's the way to stamp out the problem the other is to put all of this on uh, on uh, the website so that some of this which is should be actually public information is public information when is the government going to actually so do once that again story? you're taking the stand that the journalist who to use a euphemism purloined the material which wasn't really meant for him is not to be blamed well journalists the world over need access to documents to write stories uh, they, if they are being manipulated by corporations or for that matter by politicians that's a completely different matter and that happens okay. often enough uh, if they're being paid off that's obviously an ethical breach like corruption in any other walk of life is an ethical breach so I'm not defending any of that I'm simply saying that having access to documents on occasion that is how Watergate came to light that's how the Pentagon Papers came to light that's how lots of misdeeds of the Indian government have come to light it's absurd to be sitting here arguing that documents should not come into the hands of journalists okay. of course they should they should Sadab, be misused Sadab Vardarajan Mohan Guru Swami actually goes one step further he writes on his blog and I'm quoting him again many reporters function as the private sector's field intelligence agents and then he adds when they get caught newspapers feign shock but thereafter very quickly it's business as usual now as someone who's been an editor of a major national paper how accurate is that judgment you know one hears about this uh, I've never encountered at least in the papers that I've worked individuals who would fit that description but uh, I'm sure they exist uh, you know as a, in any profession you have rotten apples and uh, it's the duty of an editor to to apply due diligence to any story that somebody brings now it's a well-known secret that um, many of the leaks that find their ways uh, find their way into the newspapers or, or TV uh, you know, come from uh, individuals who perhaps have some vested interest in that information being put out in the public domain it may be a, a disgruntled bureaucrat it may be a, a company that's trying to undercut a rival so it's essential that uh, editorial filters be applied and, and any information be judged uh, also on the basis of asking okay why has this come to me on a silver platter uh, is there an angle here Should, do I need to look at that angle? can I interrupt uh, so it's, can, so can I, I interrupt as as do you think, those, do you think yeah. editors don't apply those filters often enough is there sometimes laxity in editorial judgment and where filters should be applied they're not and where information should be questioned it's not uh, without a doubt I think sometimes the the filtration process is perhaps too harsh uh, so for example stories critical of Reliance Industries Limited would often just get killed in many newspapers I'm okay. not talking now where a lot of dirt has come out into the open but traditionally uh, or uh, uh, they would you know go along uh, in the uh, hope that you have they have a scoop or a story that you can play up as an exclusive so yes it is true that editorial standards have slipped and uh, there is less diligence than there ought to be okay. uh, but again I, you know I want to second what Rahul said that you know it's the journalist's job to get papers 
We get them Quite from right. all kinds but, but, of sources. But, 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 but you're repeating you something you said before. You're story. repeating this, something you said before. We don't need to. We don't need to button the hatches down so much just because we're journalists. A little bit of criticism about ourselves wouldn't do us any damage at all. None at all. Let me come back to you again because Mohan Guru Swami made a third point, Professor Nandi, and he said that he had in fact contacted the expenditure secretary of the day and had pointed out to the expenditure secretary that someone like Shantanu Saika should be denied access because clearly, although it may be from the journalist's point of view legitimate, he was accessing material straight from the computer or the laptop of the advisor of the finance minister, which from the ministry's point of view was not. And so whilst journalists have a right to access documents, ministries have a right and duty to stop them. And he was suggesting to the expenditure secretary, deny this man access, and it wasn't denied. Does that suggest, and I'm not talking about that individual expenditure secretary, that this is a problem that also involves senior bureaucrats who have their own motivations and have their own reasons for encouraging journalists and handing over information to journalists, which perhaps shouldn't be happening also. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one such instance takes place, it underwrites the cynicism about journalism that is spreading in India today very, very quickly. Already so many rumors are floating around and often they are deliberately floated by the ruling party or by the opposition that such and such newspaper is in the pay of such and such uh, industrialists on such and such newspaper is actually indirectly owned by a party. This kind of things are always floating around. And does the Shantanu Saikya involvement in this espionage scandal, mm. from the point of view of how much we know of it, and we may not know the full truth by any means, mm. but does that cast a shadow over journalism? Does it increase the skepticism you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, even if he is acquitted, the shadow the stain of this will remain. Episode. Absolutely. So this is very interesting. Even if he's acquitted, hmm. the stain or the blemish will remain. Because the, it, 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 the whole thing is built on a paranoid attitude towards... In other words, hmm. doubt has been sown hmm. in the public mind about yeah. journalism. Hmm. I, yeah. Are you agree? Yeah, I, I fully agree. Let me bring you in, Mohan Goswami, because you go, to be honest, one more step further. We've gone down four at least or five of your steps, and this is what you write. Let's not forget how editors of loss-making newspapers and magazines end up with luxury homes in South Delhi and farmhouses in Chhatrapur. They trade in information and not everything reaches their readers but ends up as for your eyes only stuff for their corporate clients and financiers. You're clearly saying this is not just a matter of rogue reporters. It goes all the way to the very top of the journalistic profession, editors and editors-in-chief are involved in it as well and benefiting hugely, you claim. Absolutely. You, know, you have to just count the number of editors who live in Delhi, who live in farmhouses, who, who live, have South Delhi bungalows, and you know, people who came literally with just a bag in their hand when they came to this town. And you, know, and, and you have to wonder how they're doing so well. Because you know, journalism, all said and done, is not such a highly paid profession. Uh, it's really a, a calling. It should be a calling. But on the other hand, we see that it has completely got corrupt. It got associated with large corporations directly and indirectly. I don't mind if a corporation owns a, com a, a newspaper openly. But there is all these stories, you know, one hears about okay. newspapers flourishing uh, without circulation, without ads, and money, streams of money coming. We saw a tip of the iceberg in the Radia case when we saw one uh, TV channel was actually funded by Nira Radia. Okay, let me so let me know, bring you in. Let me bring you in at this point, Rahul Jacob, because you've been a great defender of journalists and you've been dismissive of Mohan Guru Swami's allegations, conclusions, judgment, call it what you want. But is there a possibility that the sort of cynicism that Professor Nandi says is being stoked by this particular story and the shadow of doubt that it's cast over the profession could lead to demands either from politicians or civil society for some form of third party regulation of journalists. After all, when England went through the phone tapping scandal not so long ago, that's precisely how politicians and civil society responded. Are you scared something similar could happen here? 
Absolutely. I think there is actually a rising skepticism about journalism in India and Professor Nandi, as usual, is right on the money. He's, uh, but the, this is also true of several other institutions in India. Yeah, but let's uh, stick India to ours. Let's, let's, let's stick to ours. Country. Let's stick to ours. We are yeah. journalists. Okay. We have a so, moral duty fine. to talk about ourselves <laughs> and not deflect to others. Stick Fair to enough. ours. Absolute, absolutely, ab absolutely, um, uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, I live in South Delhi and I rent. And um, but the la the larger point is there are there are going to be breaches of ethics, and this will be used by the government and others okay. to tar uh, journalism because people would prefer press release journalism where we publish exactly what they want us to publish. If that's what the public wants, so be it. But I doubt that that's what they want. Professor Nandi, what should journalists do to ensure that their autonomy of regulation is never breached, yet their image, if it is sullied, is rectified? And rectified without the government stepping in and imposing third party regulation on them. What should they do themselves? I think they should have a, they have a press council, but it is quite, I would believe it, I believe that it is quite toothless. Um, I think it should be given more powers and it, sh it should, a uh, scope should be expanded. Uh, because I remember uh, they had published some negative comments of some newspapers once. The yeah, newspapers just ignored it. So in other words, journalists themselves have to ensure that whatever self-regulatory mechanism they observe becomes stringent and has real teeth and from time to time actually bites. Absolutely. So uh, that's very quickly because we're out of time. As someone who's been an editor and someone who's deeply concerned about the ethics of our profession and its image, would you agree with Professor Nandi that to ensure that third parties don't regulate us, we need to set up a mechanism that has teeth and from time to time bites us? Oh, absolutely. I think that it's, it's absolutely essential. This is a question that can't be postponed because it's the, the ethics of news gathering, but also the, the entire financial model. I think proprietors have so corrupted the media's uh, landscape by introducing things like paid news, private treaties, that a cleanup is absolutely essential. And I can't trust the government with that cleanup. It, it's something that the media as an, as, as an industry, as a profession, must do and must do urgently. All right, which means clearly the onus is on the likes of us. If we want to be respected, we have to make sure that our own peers chastise us, chastise us publicly and actually impose punishment that hurts when we fall out of line. Otherwise, the world will laugh at us and say we're hypocrites and we don't have a right to tick off others when they make lapses. My thanks to all my guests for joining me and there we end this particular episode. If you have been, thanks for watching. Goodbye.